Joseph can start his uh, <laughs> one minute of uh, <laughs> chat. Yeah. Right. yeah? Okay. okay. There we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on the surface of this planet. We're about to begin another Clash of the Titans brought to you by the Education Committee of the ISPN. This time, it is a debate which is unique in many ways. It's unique because we're discussing something which is not mainstream neurosurgery, but concerns all of us that practice neurosurgery on this planet. It is different because for the first time, the two titans are real titans. They're not make-believe titans because both of them are former presidents of the International Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. And you don't often get two presidents on the same podium uh, together speaking against each other. What we're discussing today is the concept of global neurosurgery. Global neurosurgery post-pandemic. And if you recall, it was just a few months ago that we were traveling all over this world, moving from one country to another to run courses, give lectures, participate in international congresses in neurosurgery. And then a small little blob of RNA seemed to descend upon us and changed everything. It changed the way we were destroying the ozone layer. It also changed the way in which we did neurosurgery. And today, we are here to discuss whether post-pandemic, the idea of global neurosurgery as we understood it has become irrelevant. There is very little for me in terms of a job to introduce the speakers because neither of the two speakers today require any introduction to the audience. Proposing the theme of post-pandemic global neurosurgery being irrelevant is Professor Graham Fegan from the University of Cape Town. Graham has been the past president of the ISPN and held every single portfolio you can possibly hold in neurosurgery, both in Africa and in the international society. And Graham, of course, is his interests uh, straddle everything in neurosurgery. He also has been running the general surgery program and has been academic uh, director of a variety of uh, organizations in South Africa and Africa. Opposing him and therefore somebody who feels that the idea of global neurosurgery is not irrelevant is a man who has probably contributed more to the idea of globalization in pediatric neurosurgery than most of us mortals have. Professor William Harkness is former professor of neurosurgery at the Great Ormond Street Hospital for Sick Children. He is also a past president of the ISPN. And William has really put pediatric neurosurgery on the pedestal uh, on the world map uh, for the United Kingdom and for Europe for many, many years. And everybody who's interested in epilepsy surgery has been astounded by his uh, deliberations on epilepsy surgery. So we have two former presidents of the ISPN, Graham Fegan and William Harkness, to debate it out. And I think I should mute myself and let the first speaker speak. Professor Graham Fegan from Cape Town, South Africa. Graham, all yours. And just to let you know, I'm going to switch off my video while you speak, not because I'm running away, but because I don't want to distract the audience. Right, thank you, Sandeep. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Good evening, good morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, thank you very much for joining this webinar. It's a, it's a real treat to be uh, sharing this, this virtual space with you and with um, my good friend, William and Sandeep, who as always is, is peerlessly eloquent in, in his introduction. So thank you, Sandeep. So I must say, when I was invited to be part of the Clash of the Titans, 
the first thought that occurred to me was, I don't really know what a Titan is. So I asked one of my children, uh, Liam, who knows a lot more about uh, classical mythology than I do, and I asked him to, to suggest which Titan I should be, and he immediately suggested Prometheus. And the reason for that is Prometheus apparently is known as the most intelligent of the Titans and uh, was um, the Titan who really sort of defended humankind and, and, um, and stole fire from the gods, incurring the wrath of Zeus. So poor old Prometheus had a bit of a tough time because he was, uh, he was bound to a rock uh, in, in return for his insolence and stealing fire and giving it to humans. And uh, Prometheus' sentence was every single day uh, an eagle would come in and consume his liver and uh, it would regenerate overnight because he was immortal and the following day uh, the eagle would come back and once again eat his liver. And that, that's, the, that's the image of Prometheus that you'll find in galleries uh, over most of the world. I must say, looking at that image, it reminded me of a photograph of my opponent today, um, uh, Mr. Harkness. Uh, after yet another splendid dinner at an Indian uh, neurosurgical meeting, I think this time in Udaipur. So William clutching his liver, no doubt, uh, in anticipation of, uh, of this debate. So this is really a, this is a terrible topic because we all believe deeply in global neurosurgery. Um, so I thought in order to put a bit of fizz into debate, I would um, take a, maybe a slightly more radical approach. And uh, rather than uh, trying to argue that global neurosurgery is irrelevant, I'd really try to redefine uh, the parameters of what we consider global neurosurgery and very uh, assertively take the line that what's needed is not to get rid of global neurosurgery, but to totally decolonize uh, the current conception of what global neurosurgery is and, and essentially kind of reformulate what we're trying to do. So what I'll do is just talk for a few minutes about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and every single person on this webinar has felt that impact one way or another. It's obviously important to understand what we mean, and I'm going to talk very briefly about um, what global health is and how that has evolved through global surgery into global neurosurgery. Then talk a little bit about decolonizing global surgery and then move from the sort of what's and the how to why one would actually try and do that. Um, but I just want to make two disclaimers. So firstly, I'm, I'm speaking from, from Cape Town, I'm speaking from Africa, but I'm certainly not uh, presuming to speak for Africa. And there are a great many neurosurgeons across the length and breadth of Africa who would have their own views on, on this topic. And, and hopefully we'll have time at the end of, of this um, debate to, to hear from, from many colleagues around the world and their views of, of global surgery. And also want to make it very clear that I have a really deep appreciation of the contributions that many, many colleagues have made from all over the world uh, in many different ways in trying to advance um, global surgery and particularly global neurosurgery. So when you look at the impact of COVID-19, I think the first point is that it's, it's clearly caused enormous human suffering and, and death. And, and certainly for those of us in pediatric neurosurgery, um, we, we remember with, with great affection, uh, Jim Goodrich and other colleagues who are no longer with us due to COVID-19. It's, it's had a massive economic and societal impact. And I think one thing is for sure, it's really heightened inequality around the world. But it's also given us new opportunities, new ways of working. Most of us would have been packing our bags next week to go to Singapore for the ISPN meeting that One Two was going to host. And that's now been rolled over to 2021. And we now have these ongoing webinars, which in a curious sort of way have brought us even closer together as a community. But if, you, if you're talking about post-pandemic, I, I think one's got to be a little bit uh, realistic that we may not be anywhere close to being post-pandemic at this point. Um, what I've got on this graph is um, data that one of my colleagues in surgery, Professor Eugene Paneri, has, has uh, charted every single day uh, since early April when COVID-19 first sort of made its appearance in Cape Town, showing the typical surge that all of us have seen. But it's certainly not gone yet. We still have around 100 patients in our main teaching hospital. And I think that's a very important part of how we are going to sort of try and conceptualize how we go forward. So one of, one of the events that happened very early in the, in the COVID pandemic in South Africa was we celebrated Africa Day on the 25th of May, which was the anniversary of the founding of the African Union. Um, and I, I had the job of, of, of talking about good news stories from Africa around COVID. And there were a lot of good news stories. Um, the initial response of many African countries was amazing, actually. They had well, very well-prepared public health systems. Uh, the numbers 
were not that great. And in fact, in many African countries, the numbers have still not been that enormous. And for those who cynically think that maybe that's because there wasn't enough testing, mortality hasn't, hasn't necessarily increased that much in those countries. Um, there's been an amazing response in many African countries in terms of organizational mobilization, civil society response, research into diagnostics and treatments, and lots of, of uh, input into training and building legacy programs that, that have certainly made an impact. But there, there are many, many lessons that have been learned. And I, I, I really would, would draw your attention to this article published recently on JamaNet uh, by Lawrence Gostin, uh, who reflected on, on what he considered the seven critical lessons that we've learned from, uh, from COVID-19. And the first is the importance of building resilient healthcare systems. And I think all of us have seen the countries that have what we thought were incredible health care systems that have really been rent asunder by COVID-19. Uh, leadership and maintaining public trust is really, really important. Uh, and as we've seen in a number of, of very obvious countries that I, all of you can, can, can think of your own examples, it's been important to defend the integrity of science and public health agencies such as the WHO and CDC. Uh, investing in biomedical research and development is clearly critical in every single country. And then probably the most important concept when I'm talking about global surgery, and that is equity. And uh, Gostin calls it the prevailing narrative of our age. And I think when you talk about global surgery, it's really about equity. It's not about equality of care. It's about equity. It's about giving people opportunities that they didn't have before. It's important that our, our, our steps take going forward are based on evidence. And it's particularly important that we have robust global health institutions. We're all in this together. And that's why global health and global surgery is so important for all of us as neurosurgeons. Okay, so why is equity so important? And this is really just a cartoon demonstrating that equality and equity are not the same thing. So equality would be when you give pretty much everybody the same thing and you're not really addressing any sort of pre-existing uh, a disadvantage that people may have had, whereas equity is very much about creating um, new opportunities for people. So what is global health? Well, somewhat cynically, I think one, one might feel that global health could be defined as healthcare for other people's countries. And sometimes one gets the impression that the people who pursue uh, an interest in global health are not really sort of particularly interested in strategies they'd like to see developed in their own countries. Um, but have an intense interest in doing things in other people's countries. I think quite a nice definition of global health um, was given by Coplin and colleagues in the Lancet about a decade ago. And they really uh, distinguished global health from international health and public health. Uh, public health is not something that we as surgeons often pay much attention to, but it's, it's absolutely inextricably bound up with global surgery. Uh, and I do think many, many surgeons tend to conflate international health and global health. And international health is really about kind of paying attention to what's going on in other pe people's countries, going there, sometimes helping them, uh, sometimes actually building healthcare programs. Uh, but that's not necessarily global health. Global health really focuses on, on issues underlying systemic problems in healthcare systems and really trying to make uh, institutional change and really trying to work across different disciplines in, in trying to improve healthcare uh, sy systemically and systematically in, in countries and in regions. And I think in, in that sense, global health uh, has a far more active agenda than, than international health. So if we're going to look at global surgery, so clearly healthcare is a key component of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, surgical diseases result in a great deal of morbidity and mortality, but they've often been considered too expensive to invest in. And in fact, surgical treatment's been considered the neglected step child of global health. But all of us on this call know that there are a great many conditions we treat that contribute significantly to the burden of disease. I'm not going to belabor the point, but it's, it's clear that millions of people die every year due to lack of access to, to surgical care. And in fact, even if you get surgery, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do well. Um, amazingly, over 4 million people die within 30 days of surgery every year. The Lancet uh, Commission into Global Surgery was really the key event though, in launching global surgery as, as an entity. And I think pretty much everybody on the call is going to be familiar with these numbers. The bottom line is 5 billion people on the planet do not have access to safe, affordable surgical care. 
And that's something that all of us as surgeons need to pay attention to. As a result of that, nearly 17 million lives were lost in 2010. And that's three times as many people who died from HIV, TB, and malaria combined, which really is just an astonishing, astonishing fact. So if we're gonna make a difference, we've gotta understand that surgical care begins in the community. And part of that is understanding the notion of sustainable development. The fact that as, an, as a surgeon, you're not just sitting in the operating theater kind of doing what you wanna do. There are a bunch of different things that you can do to really improve people's access to care. And it starts before a patient even gets to a hospital. So starting to um, reduce delays through referral pathways, innovating, uh, training the workforce, and as I said, working with public health colleagues. So what we've done at UCT is we've really very actively, under the leadership of Professor Salome Maslini, who has recently profiled in Lancet, uh, set out to establish a global surgery consortium um, encompassing surgery, Ozengaini, uh, public health, anesthetics, biomedical engineering, health and rehab sciences, the Graduate School of Business, pretty much every discipline that one could imagine is somehow going to be involved in healthcare. And part of that obviously has been driven by my own interest in, in neurosurgery and the fact that as neurosurgeons, we clearly recognize that there's a huge unmet need. I think probably the, the, the first um, major sort of publication on this in neurosurgery was as uh, predictably came from the, the Harvard group, uh, Key Park, and uh, together with Walter Johnson from the WHO and Bob De Dempsey, who probably has been involved in global neurosurgery for longer than anybody else. It was essentially a call to action. But around about the same time, a very interesting study was published from my own institution, UCT, led by Professor Bruce Bickard, uh, which was called the African Surgical Outcome Study. And essentially that looked at the outcome of surgery across over a thousand different surgical programs in Africa. And the astonishing thing for neurosurgery, although we contributed very few of the patients, uh, we were represented quite, uh, twofold by the number of complications and contributed nearly 10% of the deaths with only 2.2% of the patients. So there's clearly a big challenge out there for us as neurosurgeons in terms of generating decent outcomes for patients in an African context. So if we're gonna look at, at reasons why that may be the case, once again, a study led by Key Park and a number of us from around the world contributed, uh, estimated that there are nearly 23 million patients around the world who require neurosurgical care every year, of whom just over half actually require surgery, uh, but 5 million patients will never actually receive the surgery they require. Uh, we need more than 20,000 more neurosurgeons in the world in order to deliver that care. So now in this post-COVID world, we can no longer meet in person. That was a photograph taken just a few months ago at the Indian uh, neurosurgical meeting that Sandhya posted in Calcutta. We now have these astonishing online events. Those of you who got up early in the morning, or maybe it wasn't early in the morning for you, to, to, um, to listen to Rick Booth a couple of days ago talking about Telema Pedunculate Tube. It's just an astonishing tour de force. Uh, the Clash of the Titans, amazing, amazing events. Uh, listening uh, to Tony and Arthur discussing uh, uh, multimodality monitoring, just truly, truly state-of-the-art education. Um, a wonderful event hosted by Bob Dempsey and Fiennes on last weekend, where colleagues from around the world uh, spoke about the ways in which COVID's impacted on their practice. And probably the, the online event of the year, uh, Anil Nanda's uh, Global Neurosurgery Meeting is hope is going to be hosting in a couple of weeks' time. So the, these, these, are, these are amazing, really tremendous educational events. So what, what can we do on top of this? And I, I just want to really highlight three things that I think we really have to pay attention to, which I, I think really make it very, very important that we, we really try and consider whether the way in which we're pursuing um, education, research, and, and uh, clinical practice is really contributing to global surgery. The first is educational programs that we run. And as you can see in that graphic over there, just about every single major global health and global surgical program is run from the Northern Hemisphere. That's just not sustainable. When you look at research, it's important to try and figure out who's setting the research agenda. It's often set by funding agencies. They may not be interested primarily in conditions that are relevant to individuals uh, in, in low middle income countries. Who gets the credit for the research? Often um, authors from low middle income countries 
are sandwiched somewhere in the middle of a long list of collaborators and where do we publish that research? And finally, in terms of building capacity, it's absolutely critically important that uh, all low middle income countries build institutions that can sustain not just healthcare, but also scientific research in, in their own country. And to, to kind of really can put the, put the uh, statement plainly on the table, uh, I, I really do think that in many different ways, uh, I would agree with Madhika Pai that global health still in many ways replicates colonial power structures and colonial ways of conducting ourselves. So here are a few of the, 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 the factors that, that Pi has, 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 um, has recognized and written about. One is volunteerism, and I, I happily I think this happens very seldom in, in neurosurgery, but it's certainly something that has to be very, very strongly discouraged. Um, the second is if you are going to get involved in global surgery, you absolutely have to understand colonial history and how it impacts on the countries uh, that you may be going to practice in. You have to understand uh, the nature of countries, uh, have adequate training before you go there, and understand your own very privileged position often as, as an outsider. Um, you can oftentimes destabilize what can be a, a fragile equilibrium in that country. You need to know your own limitations. You need to be completely committed to strengthening capacity. And you need to challenge the current architecture of global health. So when we talk about decolonizing global health, what are we talking about? Well, one of them, one of the most important things is that global health institutions and the power structures are almost invariably based in high income countries. And that's clearly something that, um, that skews the playing fields here. Uh, we also have to recognize that, that obviously, and I think we all recognize and understand this, that the flow of funding uh, and typically the flow of people is unidirectional, but there are great opportunities for a bidirectional flow of knowledge. And that is something we really have to work hard to, to continue to build. Uh, it is important to kind of pay attention to kind of colonial practices that might actually kind of tend to replicate that dependence of lower middle income countries. And it's really important that we challenge decisions that get made, which often have an impact on, on uh, people living in countries very far from where those decisions are made. This is, this is a very hot topic. And there's, if, you, if you look at, at journals like um, Lancet um, and BMJ Global Health, you'll see a slew of articles being published in the last couple of months. And this is, this, is a, this is an important issue to pay attention to. And there are many different strategies that are being uh, advanced as to how we can start to reconceptualize um, global health and global surgery. But probably the thing that will make the most difference of all, and really, I guess one has to really define to sort of lay down on the table, is to recognize the underlying power structures and financial relationships that continue to dominate uh, healthcare uh, across the world. A very, very small amount of money is actually required in order to establish universal publicly funded healthcare systems uh, in countries. Um, but the problem is that most uh, low middle income countries are saddled with enormous uh, burdens of debt. And I know this is clearly a very, very touchy subject and, and clearly there are many, many uh, reasons people can point to uh, ranging from uh, totalitarian governments and systemic corruption. But the fact of the matter is, we're just not ever going to make progress in advancing healthcare until we can turn the situation on its head and find a way to reverse this massive debt burden that various countries carry. And the, just to point out, in this graphic over here from recently published in, in The Lancet, um, these are countries where the, um, the amount of money spent by the, by the government on uh, debt repayments is 20 to 30% greater than the amount of money you spent on healthcare. If you're stuck in that kind of debt trap, you're never ever going to be able to correct healthcare. And I would put it to you that in that situation, talking about global health and global surgery is completely irrelevant until you can actually address the underlying fundamentals within that society. So I'm gonna end off with another Titan, and that's Fun Span On. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with his writings, I'd really recommend uh, The Wretched of the Earth, which is probably his sort of most, um, most uh, famous uh, of all his works, which really is a, is, a, is, a, is a deep study of colonialism and its impact on the world. And just to quote Fanon, uh, so Fanon's words, the colonialism hardly ever exploits the whole of the country. It contents itself with bringing to light 
the natural resources which it extracts and exports to meet the needs of the mother country's industries, thereby allowing certain sectors of the colony to become relatively rich. But the rest of the colony follows its path of underdevelopment and poverty, or at all events, sinks into it more deeply. And I think we really, really have to be very, very conscious of uh, realities like this as clinicians. However well-meaning we are and however uh, committed we are to making a difference in the lives of individual patients, if we're not actually really paying attention to these underlying systemic features, then what we do, I'm afraid, is irrelevant. So the last slide, just to end off with um, a, on a, on a positive note, so I want to quote Archbishop Desmond Tutu in the notion of Ubuntu, that we are all human through how we interact with each other. And I really don't think that there's a single concept that I've come across that conveys what global surgery is about better than the notion of Ubuntu. So on that note, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to have given this talk and I look forward to William's uh, very vigorous repast. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Graham. In um, keeping with uh, the tradition that we followed uh, in these debates, we will uh, take the questions after both the speakers have uh, given their views. So, of course, we shouldn't really call it a debate. As you know, when, uh, when Zeus and the Olympians fought against Cronus and the Titans, it wasn't called a debate, it was called Titanomachy. And Titanomachy was a 10 year war. I hope this will not last that long. Uh, and um, William is going to tell us why he doesn't think that globalization in pediatric neurosurgery is ever going to be irrelevant, pandemic or not. Uh, William, all yours. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. President, fellow ISPN members, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to take part in this sixth ISPN webinar, an excellent initiative created in the face of the current pandemic to allow interaction between ISPN members to continue. My role in this debate is to challenge the assertion of my esteemed and illustrious colleague, Professor Fegan. In a recent telephone conversation, he threw down the gauntlet by telling me that he attended one of South Africa's premier schools, where he featured strongly in the award-winning debating team. And I think you can see that he's just proved his proficiency in the skill. But this demonstration of gamesmanship was not unexpected. And at the time I didn't retaliate, but I do so now to inform him that my educational establishment in contrast was the seating, seat of learning for no less than 20 British prime ministers. And so beware, debating is in my DNA. The motion before the House is that following the current pandemic, the idea of global pediatric neurosurgery is irrelevant. Over the next 20 minutes, I will impress upon you that not only is this incorrect, but that the concept and practice of global pediatric neurosurgery has never been more relevant than it is today and will become increasingly so in the future. I thank Professor Fegan for uh, the debate that he has just put forward, because in fact, he's made my job a lot easier, uh, because I think that you will come to agree that he has argued very strongly that pediatric neurosurgery is not irrelevant, nor will it be in the future. I will divide my discussion into three parts and consider the status of global surgery prior to the pandemic, the effect of the continuing pandemic on surgery and medical education and training, and finally outline the opportunities for strengthening pediatric neurosurgery on the global stage in the future. As Professor Fegan has already pointed out, the starting point for the recent interest in global surgery came from the Lancet Commission report of 2015, which outlined the deficits in surgical care globally. Five billion of the world's population lack access to safe and affordable surgical care. But most importantly, and the point which has resonated with governments around the world, is that investment in surgery can lead to economic growth of that country. For that reason, surgery has now to be considered an indivisible and indispensable part of universal health coverage. What was the position of the World Health Organization and the World Health Assembly prior to the pandemic? In 2015, the World Health Assembly passed Article 6815, in which member states supported surgery as part of universal health care 
and declared the intent to significantly reduce the deficits in global surgery provision by the year 2030. In addition, it is now recognized that a number of the UN Sustainable Development Goals can only be achieved by investing in surgery. And in February 2019, at a workshop for the development of the National Surgical, Obstetric and Anesthetic Plans, the ENSOPS, Dr. Tedros, Director General of the WHO, reinforced the intention of the WHO to support surgical development on a global scale. And this, I remind you, was before the current pandemic. This was also before the subsequent hatchet job done by both the American press and president on both Dr. Tedros and the WHO as a whole. Certainly such uh, um, journals as the Wall Street Journal uh, gave the implication that the brief of the WHO has always been purely for infectious disease and that in pursuing other avenues of healthcare, the WHO had lost its way. Not surprisingly, perhaps knowing the agencies involved in the denouncement, this ignores history, as in 1978, Dr. Mahler, as uh, Professor Fegan has just pointed out, who was the third director of the general of the WHO, stressed the importance of universal health coverage. And two years later, when addressing the International College of Surgeons in Mexico, uh, he stressed the importance that surgery plays in the provision of healthcare for all and the roles that surgeons themselves should play in developing a foundation of surgical procedures to apply universally. What about the United Nations? In September 2019, for the first time, the UN General Council devoted its meeting to the question of universal health coverage. And after a considerable amount of lobbying from the global surgery community, included essential surgery in their targets for 2030, thus keeping in line with the objectives of the World Health Assembly. Looking at our own discipline, what do we know about the deficits in the provision of neurosurgical care globally? This paper, which my learned and illustrious colleague, Professor uh, Fegan has already referred to, and indeed was a co-author to, looked at global neurosurgery, and highlighted the shortcomings. And as Professor Fegan has pointed out, there is an estimated need for a further 23,000 neurosurgeons globally, and that need is greatest in Africa and Southeast Asia. In addition, it was calculated that an additional 5 million neurosurgical procedures were needed annually. What about pediatric neurosurgery? Where do we stand there? Well, in my presidential address, I gave the results of a survey that we carried out in 2017, looking at the provision of pediatric neurosurgery, which unsurprisingly reinforced the deficits applicable to general neurosurgery. Once again, Africa and Southeast Asia were the areas most poorly served. And furthermore, we demonstrated that in low and middle income countries, access to neurosurgical care within two hours for both emergency and elective surgery was unacceptable. Where did the ISPN stand as an organization on global neurosurgery for children prior to the pandemic? Global neurosurgery for children was a subject that I took up during my year of presidency of the ISPN and have continued since, now as a board member of the G4 Alliance, a board member of the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery, a member of the Global Neurosurgery Committee of the WFNS, and as co-founder of Intersurgeon. The ethos of global neurosurgery is embedded in the constitution of the ISPN, and you need look no further than our mission statement to see this. The fact that the ISPN has annually devoted a budget of in excess of $100,000 for education, visiting fellowships, reduced membership fees, and meeting scholarships underlies our global neurosurgical credentials and the efforts of numerous individual ISPN members of, in all corners of the globe are well recognized. So what is the situation now as we still struggle with the pandemic? The impact of the pandemic has been varied and even countries with good infrastructures for public health have suffered badly. The timing of the pandemic has also varied geographically. And so while some are emerging from the crisis, others are just entering it. In addition, where infrastructure is poor, 
we may never know the true impact as cases will go undetected and unreported. Sadly, the pandemic has also become a political weapon to some. And rather than global collaboration, we have seen some international players denying or downplaying the pandemic and attacking the very bodies set up to enable international collaboration. Nonetheless, there is clear evidence that the presence of COVID-19, either pre, peri or post-operatively, has a huge impact on morbidity and mortality for both routine and emergency surgery, particularly in the elderly. This is the, has led to the cancellation of routine surgical procedures for reasons of safety, as well as because of capacity issues due to the pressure of COVID cases. It's therefore been estimated that at least 28 and a half million surgical cases will have been cancelled or postponed due to COVID. And the implication of this going forwards is huge. In June of this year, the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery held a webinar on the impact of the pandemic on teaching. As my illustrious colleague's countryman, uh, Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon that we can use to change the world. And if we are to address the inequity of the provision of neurosurgical care for children, then it must be through education of those already in the field and also by training the new cohort of surgeons in low and middle income countries. The impact of the pandemic on both undergraduate and postgraduate education has been profound. Many medical schools have effectively closed, whilst others, where available, have used digital resources to continue education. Surgical trainees have been deprived of direct patient contact and hands-on surgical experience due to limited PPE resources and the cancellation of elective surgery. Once again, they've come to rely heavily on digital resources where these are available. There are many digital solutions in the field of neurosurgery for both education, case discussion and management. And many of these have blossomed during the pandemic. And this webinar is an example of the initiatives that have been taken. The reliance on consultations via smartphones to minimize the need for physical contact and direct patient telemedicine has significantly and irreversibly altered medical practice. However, these resources are not accessible to all, and even where open access to digital solutions is available, the presence and stability of a reliable internet connection are required. As the technology becomes more sophisticated, the requirements of the internet connection become higher. Let's now look towards the future and see what the world might look like after the pandemic, or at least once the pandemic is abated and life returns to some form of normality. The first question is whether due to some miracle, the pandemic has caused the recognized inequity to go away. Clearly the answer to this is that it is not. And, and the cancellation of so many routine surgical cases has without doubt set the situation back even further. And to the 5 million case deficit already identified, we can add the backlog caused by the pandemic. Indeed, the diversion of funds and attention to COVID has weakened the provision of surgery with scarce resources being allocated elsewhere. Also, as report, reported during our uh, global initiative for children's surgery webinar, low and middle income countries seem to have lost a disproportionate number of health professionals, thus further weakening the already fragile system. So the pandemic has exacerbated an already critical situation. Has the pandemic presented solutions? Well, the answer to this has to be yes, with a reduction in direct physical consultation due to an increase in the use of telemedicine for patient care and case discussion. The classroom has also become increasingly virtual with the use of platforms such as Zoom and YouTube for lectures and seminars. How can we take advantage of the challenges raised by the pandemic as we move forwards? One effect of the pandemic has been to give both trainees and academic surgeons a forced reduction in clinical duties, which has resulted in an explosion of publications many exploring alternative educational models. These papers cover many specialties and some of the solutions have been ingenious. For example, a number of solutions have been created for teaching laparoscopy using household items. 
the creation of a microscope stand using a cardboard box and the microscope itself being replaced by a smartphone to allow teaching of basic surgical skills. As we move forwards in the post-pandemic world, we shall have to revisit the traditional models of collaboration in global surgery. Jumping on a plane to remote areas of the world to provide surgical care and teaching will likely be a thing of the past. There will be cost factors both at an individual and institutional level which will impact on the ability of clinicians to travel to take part in global surgery initiatives. Air travel will become more difficult uh, and costly and certainly private and academic institutions may not have the resources available to devote to global surgery. As many involved in global surgery are senior surgeons engaging in what are now referred to as on-core careers, they may be potentially more vulnerable to COVID infection and thus reluctant to put themselves at additional risk by direct physical contact. What is more, even if you can travel, will you be welcome? This photograph was taken during an ISPN teaching course in the Amazon region of Brazil, where the impact of viral spread has historically had a devastating effect on indigenous peoples. And COVID seems to be no exception. On a positive note, the restrictions on travel will further strengthen near culture partnerships and collaborations. These have already been forged in many areas, but the effect of reduced long distance partnership will encourage local collaboration. In some areas of the world, this has not in the past been the custom due to historical, political or linguistic differences. But the experience of coming together during the pandemic can be seen as a means of breaking down these barriers. On the subject of collaboration, it would be impossible for me not to mention in passing the role of intersurgeon whose initial development was part funded by the ISPM. As you're aware, this is an interactive platform to bring together all members of the surgical team, as well as NGOs and academic bodies. As you can see, our membership is approaching 550 and we're represented in 88 countries around the world. We're continuing to grow and indeed introduce innovations prompted by the pandemic. We're now enrolling surgeons from other specialties and other members of the surgical team, as well as non-governmental organizations, charities, and professional bodies. Collaboration in teaching and training are intrinsic to the intersurgeon mantra, and we're expanding our reach to medical students and surgical trainees, as well as working with organizations such as FIANS. We've also recognized the need for expanding our digital strategy, and we've just launched a collaboration with Help Lightning, this is a digital technology which allows the merging of two video streams and is very useful in the field of remote surgical mentorship. This service is provided free to intersurgeon members and we are now undertaking a project with one of our NGO partners to incorporate smart glasses in the streaming process. We're also working with a company called Inter Solutions to develop a communications and case discussions app to allow collaboration both at a local and remote level. We've been heavily involved in the development of this app, which will again be available to intersurgeon members for free. The work on Help Lightning is being spearheaded by my partner in crime at intersurgeon, Jim Johnson from Birmingham, Alabama, who has extensive experience in the field of remote electronic collaboration from his work in Vietnam. Finally, I would like to mention the efforts of the recently formed WFNS Global Neurosurgery Committee. We recently held a webinar on the impact of COVID on neurosurgical training in low and middle income countries. And this raised a number of issues voiced strongly by the low and middle income trainees. Online polling during the webinar revealed a strong desire for neurosurgery to develop an online curriculum for there to be increased LMIC HIC research collaborations and for digital tools to be used for virtual surgical labs and boot camps. If we expand on this, I believe that this can only be achieved by collaboration of our neurosurgical institutions, but this must involve input from local agencies and clinicians. A standard curriculum must be developed and this should take into account local resources and circumstances. Training must be provided at a local level 
and reinforced with digital resources, which should be freely available to all, with attention being paid to the strengthening of local internet where necessary. And this is obviously an area in which outside financial support can be very usefully used. Finally, of course, the availability of equipment and its long-term curation must become a global priority. So in summary, I would like to turn to our esteemed chairman who is known by all as a Shakespearean scholar. And I'd like to give him this quote from As You Like It. This pandemic is like the venomous toad, but presents the opportunity of a duel within. To my worthy but misguided opponent, Professor Graham Fegan, I must say, as did Winston Churchill, that as an optimist, I see that opportunities for global surgery are there for the taking, whilst he, as a pessimist, can only see difficulty. To my attentive and learned audience, I draw your attention to the words of the Dalai Lama and encourage us all to work together to face the ongoing challenges raised both by the pandemic but more importantly, by the continuing inequity of global neurosurgical care for both adults and children. I trust therefore that I have convinced you before, beyond any reasonable doubt whatsoever that post pandemic global pediatric neurosurgery will be more relevant than ever. And in your hearts, I know that every one of you will resolve to contribute to the cause of global pediatric neurosurgery and improve the lot of children throughout the world. And therefore, you will have no option other than to vote against the current motion before the House. Thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, um, these were two of the most erudite um, talks we've had so far in the ISP and Clash of the Titans. Uh, before um, going into um, the nitty gritty, uh, let's take some of the questions that have come. Uh, Graham, uh, first question is to you. What exactly, how exactly do you distinguish decolonization from deglobalization? Uh, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself, Graham. Yeah. How do you distinguish decolonization from deglobalization? So, well, so clearly, I mean, de globalization is a is a phenomenon that has kind of really kind of swept the world over the last, particularly the last decade. And um, for for those of you who who read the Economist, um, the Economist by by May had already sort of decried the the, the end of globalization um, as as a wonderful phase of human development that had just been swept away by the pandemic. Um, and globalization clearly relates to a very complex web of, of trade and, and uh, other human interactions and financial relationships um, that, that, that clearly is very current and, and determines a lot of the day-to-day -day aspects of our lives. Um, whereas colonization clearly has a historical slant to it. And that, that would be, we'd then need to rather understand decolonization in terms of looking at the issue of equity and looking at historical injustice and how you're going to try and, and correct that. And I think there are different processes. Um, and as we've seen, um, globalization has been swept aside by COVID, whereas nobody could argue that um, the legacy of colonization has been swept aside. If anything, it's only been exacerbated. So I think there are two very fundamentally different um, processes. There is a question from your colleague from Kenya, Dr. Qureshi, and he says, and I'm quoting, he says that given that the current format upon which efforts in global neurosurgery have been carried out, and that the futility of pre-COVID-19 initiatives have, which have been shown up as inadequate, would it not be right to suggest that global health initiatives as we have been practicing to date have indeed become completely irrelevant? And that by accepting this, we shall change our paradigms of addressing the inequity that we see globally. So it's a question from Kenya. I think uh, you should be best. Who's, who's it directed towards? 
Well, I think, we, shall we both have a crack at I it? I think it's uh, directed to both from Dr. Quraysh. Mo Mo Moody is obviously giving us an extremely contentious issue to deal with. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to kick off, William? Um, well, I think that, that uh, obviously M Moody has a unique um, insight into uh, the question that he has proposed. Uh, I think that if we were to look at the um, Article 6815 that had the objective of achieving uh, a, a huge improvement in uh, surgical care throughout the world by 2030, it, it is clear, I think he's correct, we have failed. Um, I think though that um, uh, in the field of neurosurgery, I think that um, very interestingly, having become involved in this global surgery field, uh, I've discovered that some of the most active people within it are actually neurosurgeons. And I think that for our own specialty, I think that we are making inroads. I would completely agree um, that this is the opportunity to rethink what we're doing uh, and the way in which we're doing it. It's not all a question about money, it's a question about uh, people's input and their dedication. Uh, and I think that, that we can achieve more. So I think that I wouldn't be as pessimistic as Moody, but I do think that this uh, uh, pandemic has given us the opportunity uh, to rethink our approach. Um, and, uh, and I think on the subject of uh, the, the, the colonial history, obviously, uh, uh, as somebody who, who is um, clearly British, uh, it, it's very difficult for me to make uh, any comment about uh, the impact of, of, of colonialization, um, because I I inevitably uh, our history has been appalling, uh, as many other European countries. Uh, but I think that um, perhaps if we don't allow, allow ourselves to be allied to governments, but uh, to work in a more humanitarian way, um, then I think that we can hopefully uh, escape some of the problems that, that uh, uh, could potentially take place. Brent, do you want to add to that? Yeah, thank, thanks, William. So, so Moody, yeah, fantastic question. So, as William says, it, it, it really is quite striking how, how the extent to which neurosurgery and neurosurgeons have, have engaged with global surgery. And it's a bit of a paradox because I, I don't think there's any other specialty that is so focused on the individual as neurosurgery. You know, we'll spend you know, an entire day taking out a very complex uh, hemispheral tumor in a, in a two-year-old child and, and uh, massive technical challenges and everything focused you know, on, on, on one particular patient, which in a sense is the antithesis of, of global health. But um, I think with neurosurgery, there are many, many of the conditions that we, we treat that are common in, in low middle income countries. So there's, there's a tremendous incentive to, to get involved. And as, as, I, as I said quite clearly when I started, I, 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 re I really want to be very, very clear that I, I, I think that that commitment that a, a lot of our colleagues have had to, to going in and, and making a difference and operating on individual patients and trying to build up kind of healthcare systems and, and various uh, twinning partnerships that, that, have, um, that have been established. I see some of our colleagues from Addisa on, on this webinar. I, you know, for me, that's one of the best examples of, of how partnerships have happened between um, sort of Norway and, and Ethiopia in developing a neurosurgical service. And I absolutely wouldn't say that that is irrelevant, but I do think that if one is going to look at really making a significant difference, uh, one's got to look beyond the immediate challenges of providing neurosurgical care and look at the sort of systemic factors that actually drive the, the inequity and the, the historical disadvantage that countries and communities have to deal with. And it's not, you know, in a way it sounds like, you know, neurosurgeons becoming politicians, but I, I, I would sort of take a leaf out of, out of Jeff Blount's book and maybe Adrian Caceres, who I see is also on the call, um, in, in, in underlining the advocacy role that we can play. Um, you know, if we pick up the cudgels on behalf of any particular issue, um, and as an organized community, we, we, we can have an impact, we can start to effect change. And I think that's something we shouldn't overlook. In fact, Adrian, <laughs> sir, Adrian has, a, since you mentioned his name, is online with a very interesting comment, which is that, you know, COVID-19 has altered uh, many ways in which uh, we, uh, as surgeons, uh, behave. For example, 
uh, we wash our hands a lot more number of times today because of COVID-19 than we did before. So do you think this actually has a positive side? It might actually impact uh, the amount of post-operative infections that we deal with in uh, lower middle income countries because uh, you know, we get, we get, we're going to get into this practice of, of hand washing, which is really very important and something which is disregarded in many parts of the world. I think um, I, I, I'd just like to pick up on Graham's point about the politician. I think in my ISPN address, I highlighted, I think about half a dozen neurosurgeons who've become very eminent um, politicians in their own countries over the years. Uh, and I think maybe rather than, I, I talked about um, maybe some of the senior surgeons might not wish to take part in their encore careers uh, and travel all over the world, but maybe we should divert some of our senior surgeons in the direction of some form of politics. Because I think that uh, uh, we really do need to have some input on the political stage. And I think that um, going back to Graham's comment about the Harvard School, of course, they've been int in intimately involved in developing um, uh, national surgical obstetric and anesthetic plans, the NSOPs, uh, around the world. Uh, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, the input of neurosurgeons into that is absolutely vital. And whilst NSOPs are being developed, um, I think that this really is the opportunity for neurosurgeons to make themselves heard. You know, if, if you look at the, the ISPN, um, page that you quote, it says uh, that one of the aims of the ISPN is to provide practical support to under-resourced colleagues. Do you not think that there are two problems with this? Number one, uh, when all the countries in the world are now going to go through an economic recession, uh, is it going to be easy for them to help financially their less well-off colleagues, number one? And number two, uh, William, you have this fantastic slide. When you get there, will you get there and will you be welcome? You know, one of the things that COVID-19 has done to us is uh, made us uh, make our borders much more uh, solid and much more tight than they were before. And, and we have become increasingly suspicious of people from other countries that may come to our country and, and start a, a, another COVID pandemic. I mean, this is across the world. So given I this scenario, well, how I think is it going to be to sort of go somewhere and offer help? I think that's why the digital world is so, gives you such an advantage because you don't have the same physical borders. Obviously you have time differences, which many people have found a, a problem. Uh, but also you're not necessarily talking about a huge investment uh, financially. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think that we really need to be exploring um, digital tools even more. And, uh, you know, for people who are in remote settings, the development of online curriculums, online teaching platforms, this sort of thing. Uh, and as I've said, the sort of things that we're offering and continuing to offer on Intersurgeon uh, are no cost to uh, either user at either end of the communication. Uh, and I think agencies that uh, offer things uh, that will improve um, patient care in this sort of way and education and training are, are very, very important. So I, I think you're right, physical communication uh, will reduce, but I think virtual communication, and let's face it, although it may be uh, quite difficult and then a bit of an anathema still for a lot of us, for the younger generation, they do all of their, their lives, uh, including their personal lives, many of them online. Uh, and I think that uh, that is going to be the way of the future. Graham, what hmm. about Africa? Because one of the problems we've seen in India is that schools are taking classes online, which is fantastic if you live in a city. The large population in India, majority of the population has smartphones. But internet access is very poor in many parts of the country. So there's been a big problem with schools taking classes online. How, what is the situation, do you think, in Africa? I mean, if it's very easy to say we use virtual tools. We can use virtual tools to, to say what we want to say. But those people that need to hear it, 
do they have internet access uh, enough to be able to receive that? <clears throat> yeah, uh, thanks, Andy. So, I mean, that's <clears throat> obviously a huge opportunity for organizations like the ISPN. They're wonderful uh, possibilities in terms of providing online education. And I, I spoke about some of those as with William. But, I mean, there, there are a couple of problems. And the first is that <clears throat> education needs to take place within a coherent framework. And one of my concerns about the sort of proliferation of online education that's available is that you can't, uh, and let's just maybe stick to, to neurosurgery to begin with, you can't, you can't learn neurosurgery through a series of plenary lectures. And just seeing a whole lot of amazing webinars and online presentations by incredibly illustrious neurosurgeons is never going to give you a solid foundation uh, in the discipline. And I, I do have a concern that um, the sort of the, the, the star factor of the, the sort of online education might, might have a sort of erosive effect on, on um, fairly pedestrian teaching that might take place within countries in terms of basic training programs. So that, that, would, that would be the one concern. The, the, the second is that, um, you know, we've certainly in South Africa, like India, there's uh, tremendous disparities in, in um, in, in wealth and I think we've got the highest Gini coefficient in the world so the highest level of inequality and, and you know many of our students do come from incredibly poor communities where you know they're very limited uh, internet access and the universities had an enormous challenge to make sure that what was called emergency remote learning could continue and that that required universities to buy laptops and get it's all sorts of mechanisms for students to get um, online access in, in remote rural communities. Um, and that's, that's kind of kept things afloat this year. But it does, it does raise the question, uh, which is now being debated quite, quite vigorously, as to you know, what is a university for? If you can replicate the sort of educational components of university online, then actually you need to come to a physical campus. And I, I think there's a... There's an echo of that in, in the question that you put to, to William about um, whether we need physical meetings. And may, maybe, maybe I'm a bit of a dinosaur, but my goodness, I'll, I'll be completely devastated if we, if we turn our back on physical meetings and, and, and really sort of decide that we no longer have to um, see each other. And that, you know, clearly the, the insane proliferation of meetings that I think we all kind of recognized and regretted uh, over the past decade all of us have just had more and more meetings to get to and they've become less and less efficient. I mean, it, it's a good thing that that's, that that's been halted now, and we clearly, I don't think we'll ever go back to that. But hell, it would be a pity if we, if we, if we decide we don't, don't need to meet in person anymore. And, and, and I think the, the, the scenario that I would put to you is, it, it's fine for us, we know each other. We've, we've you know, you, me and William probably seen each other at 30, 30 meetings or more over the course of our careers. Um, what about the next generation? You know, what about the next group of trainees that are going to um, become part of the sort of global neurosurgical community? Perhaps, as you say, they're so familiar with living online that actually that's, that's going to be fine. And, and it's, a, it's a silly concern on my part. Um, but I don't think so. I, I think that there's, there's such huge value in sort of human you know, person to person communication and, and getting together. And I, I certainly hope to goodness we're all going to see each other in Singapore next year. Yeah, we, we really yeah, don't want to see each other. Yeah, sure. So, so I think that um, uh, I, I, I know what Graham means about the kind of the plethora of uh, educational tools that are out there. But I, I think that's exactly why I said in, 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 in my debate uh, that we really need collaboration between people like the WFNS, the AANS, the ISPN, the ESPN, to help iron out a standardized curriculum. I mean, I think that I, I also agree that producing uh, a large number of webinars about, about incredibly esoteric uh, subjects is really not of very much use to uh, your average um, neurosurgical trainee, whatever country they're in, quite frankly. Um, and I think that we somehow need to help the next generation uh, to sort of see the wood for the trees amongst all of this plethora. And I think that we should look to our uh, major representative professional bodies to work together to try and sort something out like that out. With regards internet access, I, I completely agree. Having the tools such as smartphones and 
um, internet access itself are extremely important. But maybe rather than spending lots and lots of money on um, you know, trips uh, abroad, people can invest in, in, in internet provision. Uh, if you take the example of Nepal, uh, Nepal after the um, uh, earthquake uh, received um, uh, financial support I think to the tune of a, it was only about 10 or 20 million dollars, uh, but they were allowed, they were therefore able to rebuild uh, their internet connection so that practically every part of Nepal has very good internet service. And I've certainly been uh, at base camp at Everest and you get fantastic internet reception. So I think that, um, you know, you can achieve these things with relatively low cost and uh, maybe concentrating on things like that rather than more esoteric subjects might, might actually be of benefit to people. The other side of that, of course, is that over the last four months, on behalf of at least three organizations that have been contacting pediatric neurosurgeons all over the world to participate in webinars, mm -hmm. and you'd be interested to note that at least three professors of neurosurgery have turned me down saying, we just cannot speak to a computer. I'm used to speaking to an audience and unless I get reaction from my audience, I will, I just cannot give a talk of any sort. And these are very much world famous people uh, that we would have uh, normally heard at various meetings. Thank right. you for a bunch of fantastic questions that have come through. Yes. In fact, uh, talking about education, there is a question from another ex-president of the ISPN to two present presidents of the ISPN, question from Rick, Rick Abbott. And Rick Abbott says, do the speakers feel that the ISPN, through the efforts of our educational committee, has increased the awareness of the current management of neurosurgical diseases globally, to a level where we should consider altering our mission to mentorship in applying this knowledge. Well, um, <laughs> Graham, you go first. I'll have a crack at that. So, hi, Rick. It's it's, it's great to great to have you online. Um, thank you, thank you for listening. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I I do think that. We've, we've still got a long way to go. If you just look at, at you know, the, the, the challenge I referenced earlier, sort of folate uh, fortification, I think we're a long way from done in terms of, of, um, of completing that, that work. Um, and I wish, I wish it were true that we've done such a great job of, of increasing awareness that, that um, we, we could now get on with the practical application. Um, so I think that that will remain a work in progress, but mentorship, a mentorship is, is critical, and I, I, I really do think that um, I, I suppose that that's one of the areas where I would have um, concern about the sort of double-edged nature of the sort of online um, engagement. Um, you know, clearly it's it's fantastic, and there are a couple of wonderful comments made by some of the younger participants about how much easier webinars have made it to participate in education, and that that's absolutely true. It would be interesting to try and establish how easy one could form a mentorship uh, relationship with somebody online who could guide you in your career. I, I, I guess there's no reason why that couldn't happen. And Rick, I know you, you've, you've championed the idea of, of mentorship for a very long time, and this may, may be a great opportunity to, to you know, pursue that and see if there are some ways we could really make sure that every young neurosurgeon out there, and particularly every young pediatric neurosurgeon through the ISBN, um, has, has a mentor that they can engage with online. William, you want to react to Rick's question? Yeah, no, I think that that's a brilliant idea. I think that the, um, the idea of, of, of mentorship and the assignation of mentors to um, uh, trainees in low and middle income countries, I think would be an excellent idea. I, I think that the other thing is, I'm, I'm gonna pick up on a, a, a comment by uh, Phil Aldana. Um, and uh, I, I think that, and this is something that will resonate with Moody, and I, I mentioned it because I used one of Moody's slides in my presentation, and that's about um, uh, collaborations that occur in, in countries or in institutions that are geographically close to each other, and uh, I think that um, Phil is right. I think that we should be looking at a much more regional approach, 
um, uh, to uh, education uh, and training. Uh, and to a certain extent, I think that's beginning to happen. But as I mentioned, the, there are so many um, political, um, uh, historical and li linguistic difficulties sometimes that prevent all of that. Uh, but I'm hoping that uh, certainly if we follow the, uh, um, the advice of the Dalai Lama, um, we should, coming through the, the pandemic, um, really concentrate on uh, our efforts on working together to try and uh, overcome these sorts of issues. We've had lots of questions. Uh, some of them are, um, are repeat, so we'll ignore that. And we're reaching the end of our time. But I'm going to take the opportunity to ask you a question as uh, you know, a very personal question as chairperson of the Education Committee of the ISBN. Do you think we should run online courses, the sort of courses that we did by physically traveling to places, getting together and, and interacting? Do you think that now the time has come for us to run, or perhaps we should run our education courses online currently, but is that the way the situation should be in future as well? What do you think? Should we do our online courses on behalf of the education committee now? And what about the future? Should we run them in future as well? Shall I, shall I give you my view first? Um, yeah, go ahead. I, 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 think, I think that, that Without doubt, unless you start running some online courses, I think that the um, the efforts of the educational committee uh, will uh, wither on the vine. I, I think we really do need to get on and do some uh, online teaching. Now, I, I don't for a, a moment know how successful that will be. And I think that you should try one or maybe two as a sort of trial period. Um, it is much more difficult to run things through Zoom meetings. Um, they don't tend to be as fluid or as interactive as uh, seminars held in person. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that, that we should try them. And going forwards, I think that we should view um, the uh, teaching and educational efforts probably as a mixed thing, where some of the faculty do travel and some of the faculty attend virtually. Uh, and I think that that's how we should be looking forward to the future, as indeed I think our annual meetings will become as well. I think there's going to be an uh, increased need and demand for uh, people to attend virtually, which I think will be very positive because I think for people in low and middle income countries who have traditionally found it very difficult to attend, may find it much easier to attend virtual rather than physical meetings. In fact, I've just got my first invitation to a meeting in the end of January 2021, saying that it's a hybrid meeting, uh, which is the term they use, and saying that they would give me an option either to come physically or to speak online, and I have to give them my option in the next uh, month or so. Graham, what do you think? You've been involved with the Education <laughs> Committee for a long time. So, <clears throat> Sandeep, my answer would be uh, for sure, but just for goodness sake, please don't try and replicate um, what we do in person online. I, I think that would be missing such a great opportunity. And, I, you know, here we, we're getting all these questions coming in that we can't even keep up with. And I think finding ways to, to, to really um, enliven this, this sort of this, this uh, the discourse that you can have with an online meeting, um, which, which I think happens far more comfortably and far more easily than, um, you know, if you sit in an auditorium, you don't know people, to put up your hand and go and grab a microphone and ask a question, perhaps in a, in a language that you don't feel completely comfortable in, is, is awkward. Um, there's a level of engagement, and I think also the ways in which you can build in sort of um, feedback and assessment and all those sorts of things uh, and make, make online education a lot more dynamic and a lot more challenging. So please, please do it but um, not, not just a bunch of, of lectures online. Yeah, I think the reaction is important as, as, as uh, we've heard from some of the professors who've refused to come online. And most importantly, I worry when I give an online talk, whether the audience is actually there or asleep. And a problem that doesn't occur when William is talking from the stage. I mean, when William talks online, I guess nobody sleeps anyway, but I often wonder when I do, where the people fall off to sleep. And that's really been my reason for deferring this, uh, 
this online course as far as possible. But I think that we have no choice but to do that right now. If we are going to be advocates of education and pediatric neurosurgery. But I, I take Graham's sure. point that we really like to see each other. I mean, most importantly, I think it's quite useful for, um, for the younger people to know whether we have two legs or not, because we just see above the chest uh, when we give these talks. I, I, think, I think I entirely agree with you, Sandeep. I think that, that historically, I think personal interaction has been extremely important. And I felt that the first time I started attending the, the training courses and the ISPM meetings, um, that uh, when you meet people or listen to people in person, you get a much better impression as to whether or not uh, you are uh, inclined to believe what they say or not. Uh, and, uh, but, but I want to throw the cat amongst the pigeons. And I, I, I think that every single surgeon will say, oh, well, there's absolutely no, uh, no replacement for hands-on experience. And, you know, it's as if this is a sort of rite of passage and you've got to get blooded and you've got to do this and that. And, and I would draw attention actually to um, things like the aircraft industry where uh, pilots do the majority of their training uh, on simulators before uh, they actually uh, fly a plane. And look at race, Formula One racing now. Um, they are now selecting drivers not having gone through karting and everything else, but from doing virtual Formula One. And uh, I think McLaren have just taken on a, uh, a driver who had never actually got into a, a, the driving seat of a, a proper car before he got into a Formula One car. So I think that a lot of things are being turned on their head. And I think that we should be looking to see how we can create much more effective virtual and simulation models uh, for surgical practice um, so that we can obviate the need for many of these things. Um, and, and that's how, the, 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 obviously this isn't just the role of the ISPN, but generally I think the surgical professions should be exploring this much, much more, um, uh, much, much more carefully. In fact, one of the uh, criticisms that we had when we talked about online courses was um, some of our faculty told us, look, the students learn not a lot uh, during the lectures I give, but they learn a lot during the tea break and the coffee break and the lunch when we sit around and we discuss. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can actually do that in an online session also. You can still have a 10 minute free for all question answer session type of thing. So I think we have to move that way in, in at least if we're going to have our presence felt for the next few months before uh, things start normalizing, which we all hope uh, they will do one day. So it's been a great debate. Thank you very much, uh, William, and thank you very much, Graham, um, uh, particularly to William, because I know but, how difficult it is. we get a vote? Be. Hang on a second. We, we've got to ask everybody to vote. <laughs> no, no, they no. all need to vote we, against we, his no. motion. We, we all the motions, you, traditionally, all the motions that we've had uh, have been... Um, uh, have had equal number of people voting for and equal number of people voting against. Uh, oh, well, this so would we, be the exception. This would be the exception. They, they, <laughs> they quite clearly vote against, you know. So I think we that's why we've avoided uh, taking a vote. But uh, I think um, really uh, both of you have been excellent. And in reality, both of you have championed the course of global neurosurgery and global pediatric neurosurgical education. So thank you very much. And it's been a great evening uh, for me. So uh, just it all, all that remains for me is to tell you about the next debate. Linda, do you think we can share a screen and show them the, uh, the next debate? Fantastic. So the Clash of Titans episode seven is going to be in the first Friday of September. And we're going to have two titans talking about Craniosynostosis surgery. Federico Di Rocco from Lyon in France is going to tell us that open surgery is the preferred way in surgery for craniosynostosis. Mark Proctor from Boston, USA is going to tell us that's not true and that endoscopic techniques are much better. Thank you very much. On that note, we'll see you again in a fortnight's time. Goodbye. Thank you. <clears throat>